great stuff for the community. Hi, and welcome to everyone who's coming to the webinar on COVID-19. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we're really pleased to have to go through this webinar. Um, it's an opportunity for us to look at uh, various parts of Africa and see how um, sh you know, the, uh, the epidemic is progressing. My name is Shabi Musa. I'm the president of Wonka Africa and also facilitator of the Afro PHC. Um, a forum to bring together primary health care activists in the primary health care team across Africa. Uh, we also have uh, representatives WHO and we'll give them an opportunity to raise some issues and talk. I also have a special guest, um, Jeff Markins from the PHCPI here. So welcome, Jeff. Um, but firstly, our focus today in our series this Friday is to look at the response in Kenya. And I think there's some really good stuff happening there and we really appreciate the work that's been done. I'm going to hand over to Joy Mugambi, who is the Secretary of Wonka Africa and quite involved in Afro PHC as well. Um, she's going to introduce herself in a little bit more detail and introduce uh, Dr. Kitulu, uh, who's from Kenya, and together they will provide us some insights into what is happening in Kenya. So over to you, Joy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Shabir. Uh, my name is Dr. Joy Mugambi. I'm a family physician working in Baringo County. I also am the secretary of Wonka Africa, and I'm glad to be here to share what we are doing. I'm currently working in a very rural population. We are lucky enough not to have had any cases currently. And um, I'll be introducing Jackie Kitubu, She's the president of Kenya Medical Association and also very active as an advocate of healthcare and quality healthcare. She's currently seated at the Quarantine Command Center uh, in Nairobi and has been coordinating the care of the quarantine centers. So I'll begin with sharing a bit about what we are doing at the community level and then we will engage with uh, Dr. Kitulu on what they have been doing in terms of the mitigation factors and uh, uh, care at the very national level. At the, let me begin with sharing that, if that's okay, Prof. Shabir. So. So at the community level where I am, which is a very rural population, what we did at the very beginning was to at least ensure from the very entries of the hospital, we had ensured that we have put caveats that hinder entrance of people who would easily transmit infections. We register everyone at the gate. That's our security guards doing the registration at the very gate. Um, once people get in just a few meters from the gate, we have our triage nurse who does the temperature checks and records and takes a brief history in terms of do, does the patient have a cough, does the patient have a fever, and records this down in an event that they do have. If they do have fever and cough, they take the left, I mean the right side, and walk to a holding area, which we will see in a few minutes. From, from there, if you have no cough, no fever, and uh, you're okay, you're just coming for your normal outpatient routine care or chronic care clinics, you walk to your right, left side uh, and you're attended to. So within the facility, we started facility testing, uh, which is done at the holding area once these uh, clients are triaged and moved on. 
initially we were doing uh, the testing you see on the left uh, where we were in direct contact with the patient. Uh, these hazmat suits were part of what had been donated during the Ebola crisis uh, in preparedness of Ebola, but they are few and they are running out. And in an event we had patients to care for, we saw that this would be a challenge. So borrowing from the model of uh, Korea, we, we made a COVID booth where it's made of glass and perspex at the front with uh, gloves popping out at the very front of the screen. Uh, then we examine our patients using this COVID box and take samples from this area. And then uh, later someone comes in to do the disinfection of the cube. We don't have very many cases, so um, it's easy to disinfect, but in an event we have to do mass testing will be using less PPE and will have a, a much more efficient system of being able to test faster than having to don and doff uh, with every patient, which is quite tedious. Um, at the community level, we've been called uh, for a number of cases, either died in the home states uh, without a defined cause we've had to go into the community and collect samples uh, before the police collect the bodies and take them to the mortuary. So the case up there was on Monday where we were collecting a sample. Earlier on we were also taking samples from those who had traveled and come into the community and isolating them in their homesteads. Most of our community members have homes where we can keep them with larger houses and uh, larger farms where they can easily be more free rather than outweighing our facilities where we are at. Uh, this is part of our community engagement strategy. We get out into the community and we educate uh, communities at the home state. We've also noted with asking the question of cost, uh, We've started getting more cases of uh, TB captured early enough. This was uh, the, the, on, on my right, we were um, out in the community screening a family that uh, we had detected uh, MDR TB in their home. And part of that was my uh, public health officer educating the community. So uh, despite the fact that we are just asking about um, cough, we are coming up with other public health issues that we've had as an agenda which have uh, been uh, not been tackled adequately as we have been caring for these patients. So that's us walking into the community uh, with a lot of assistance from the chiefs and the community elders who really assist us in terms of uh, getting to the communities, engaging with the communities without any issues. So thank you. Um, despite all that, we've not forgotten the non-communicable diseases. We are doing quite a lot in terms of uh, educating also the community in terms of heart health, smoking, exercising, despite them being at home. A number of them had stopped farming, but we are encouraging them to get back to the farms because we are having quite a lot of rains and we need people to be healthy post all this COVID issue. So thank you. I move it back to you, Prof. Shabir. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. Um, do you want to say, have, do you have any comments, um, Jacqueline? Would you like to share some insights from your side? All right. Um, good afternoon. Or is it good evening? Uh, whatever <laughs> time it is, wherever you are. <laughs> um, so I'm Dr. Jacqueline Kitulu. I'm the president of the Kenya Medical Association. Um, I am also a practicing uh, general practitioner and I am currently situated at the National Coordination Center for Quarantine and Isolation Facilities uh, in Kenya. Now, um, I, I thank you, Joy, for, for giving uh, what is happening at the, at the community level. 
I am seated at the quarantine facility uh, national level, and this was a command setup that was set up um, rather impromptu, rather uh, impromptu at the end of, of March. After um, uh, I mean, our first case was reported in the 13th of, of March, and then as the cases grew rather slowly initially, but um, our borders were closed from March, March 27th. So the directive was given by the president that anyone who came in within that period would have to go into mandatory quarantine for 14 days. And um, so the quarantine command center was set, was, uh, was born. Uh, there were no clear uh, strategies and structures then, so it was absolutely chaotic because in the three days that persons were allowed to come in before our borders were closed, we had 2,700 people coming in. Um, so we had over 60 quarantine facilities, public facilities and hotels. It was, um, and a lot of, I mean, now in retrospect, we have set all the structures in terms of IPC training for, for the facilities staff, for the med, ensuring that medical staff placed on, on site, um, uh, as well as, um, you know, availing the PPE that was necessary for those who were on site, the psychosocial support. I mean, there are several issues that arose with time that we realized. But now I can say that in retrospect, that was a, a very good move because in our initial cases that were picked up, um, it, the first maybe 150 cases, more than 80% of them were imported were from those who were in quarantine. So clearly um, that move to, uh, to mandatorily quarantine, those who arrived in um, made a big difference in, in picking those early cases. Um, so as we've, go, uh, we've gone through that period, of course, a vast number of them uh, were tested, those who were positive, then now we move to the next stage, moving them into isolation. The isolation facilities that we have are, are, are hospitals as of now. Um, and um, uh, so we have in Nairobi and in Mombasa, where most of the cases are. Um, so, uh, it, interesting, the statistics we have now, of course, the numbers have grown with community spread. And, um, and we are now even thinking what are next steps because the hospitals are right now having all those who are positive, but 80% um, of them are totally asymptomatic, not requiring oxygen, nothing, requiring nothing at all, but just being kept in for isolation until they can get two negative tests before they are discharged. But we are now looking at next steps because um, at that point we only had a hundred and so cases. As of today, we have six hundred and um, um, what is it about six hundred and twenty something um, uh, cases as of today. Now, as we pick up, as we have ex expanded on the testing and we are picking up more and more of the positive cases, um, we are now thinking of next steps. That what do we do? with all those positive asymptomatics. And part of the discussion, of course, has been a push towards home quarantine or self-quarantine at home, but knowing our social setup and knowing how, uh, and even looking at the cases we have right now, that there's a lot of clustering in homes, that uh, that, that might not necessarily be the best option. So as, as one of the options being discussed, can we have institutions where we don't necessarily have to go through the expenses of um, hospital care, you know, the PPEs, the doctors, the nurses, and all looking after otherwise asymptomatic persons, so that we can maybe have their asymptomatic in, in institutions where you can maybe have one or two nurses to just ensure they are not uh, progressing. Um, but I, I think maybe those are some of the issues I can highlight. And then right now, uh, we have a new challenge uh, because uh, we had the government um, decide in the last uh, one week to let in those from Kenyans who had, were stranded in countries, various countries from India, from uh, China, and from the UK. So last night we had a large team of about 300 come in from India, and more than half of them are actually patients who had gone for cancer treatment, for transplant, and a whole lot of, you know, um, immunosuppressive conditions. So um, the, condi the condition they were given is that they would have to, to, to be tested um, to come with a COVID negative certificate. And then for those with the comorbidities that would then organize for them to self-quarantine. So actually that's the first lot, the special lot who have been given an opportunity to quarantine at home. 
but they are going to be followed up by the county public health officials. They are going to be retested and there's a strict protocol for them to follow. All others who are coming in on these repatriation flights still have to go into mandatory quarantine and they shall be tested on day 13 before they can move. I mean, if they're negative, they release home or if positive, then move into isolation centers. Maybe that's a little highlight. There's a lot more I can say, but maybe let me just stop at that for now. Thank you very much. I think that is never, never too short. So thank you very much. I think that um, uh, what, what we'd like to do is to just look at whether there are any questions or comments um, from others. I think uh, I've, I've asked for anyone who would like to make comments to actually lift their hands. Uh, um, let me just quickly see, we've got someone. Uh, let's allow him to talk. Uh, Jared Jules, I think he has got his hand up. Any questions you have for the uh, Kenyan team, if you don't mind uh, just simply writing to the Q&A and for anyone else who'd like to make comment uh, and talk about either in uh, Kenya, your experience or in any other country in Africa, feel free, free to raise your hands and we can unmute you. Um, so please, uh, I think uh, Jules, you're allowed to talk if you can go ahead. Yeah, hello to everyone. Welcome. I'm uh, Dr. Abdulaza Munango Jude from DRC. I'm a resident uh, at the uh, University of Pakistan, Congo, at Kinshasa, but uh, we are based uh, at Goma, in Goma at uh, Hill Africa Hospital. Uh, I'm very glad to see the experience of um, uh, Dr. Aga. The community approach that they use to, to inform people. And uh, I think uh, it should be better for every family physician to orient, to orient that approach of uh, uh, non hospital central treatment care. Uh, because the community has to be informed and uh, to be. Uh, to be updated about, uh, about the news uh, of COVID is now and uh, other pathologies which can be uh, in uh, people and COVID is now. Uh, in case of that is because and um, uh, I question and other for us here in in, uh, in Goma and in Africa, there was uh, many strategies uh, stated by the the head uh, of uh, the governor of the province uh, and uh, at each level, province ministries of health uh, and uh, structures, hospitals and uh, health centers. Uh, our strategy, the strategies that we used here in Goma was firstly uh, measures taken by the, the governor who uh, started by uh, make uh, the distanciation measure in social and the community uh, in order and uh, to limit uh, the work in uh, governor's offices and the other offices in the the province, uh, minimum service, uh, other communities, the hand washing, which uh, was uh, putting in every area in uh, each, each five, uh, one, each one, uh, 100 meters in the, in the town. At the hospital, we started by informing the patients who came to our and uh, in our hospital, we have two inter, 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 inter space for one for patients and uh, one for uh, professionals of the hospital. And uh, when you arrived at the inter of patients, there is the, the box for place for wash and hand washing and uh, the three-edge space. There we start by taking the, 
with thermoflash, the temperature, and uh, you can enter to one box where they can take some measure, uh, vital signs, blood pressure, uh, temperature, respiratory rate, and the pulse. And when you finish by there, you can go now to the uh, reception where we repeat again the reassessment of uh, uh, the secondary the secondary assessment, if we can call it like that. After there, now they can send you to another. But what I, I don't uh, mention the two my, in my speech is at the first assessment point, if they found that you have all the signs of COVID-19, or one of the signs, or one of the points, for, uh, for example, you have, uh, when we start, when you have the, the history of uh, coming from another country, as we are, we have two borders with Rwanda and, uh, and Uganda, they can immediately call the COVID the report team and come to to take samples and you can't enter in other reception uh, or in the hospital. You stop by there. When they see you, you are asymptomatic. You have no signs, uh, no story of go, of coming from another country. You can run that step, the first step. And at the enter of the reception, they are oh, again a hand hand washing hand washing uh, point. It means that you wash your hands second, uh, secondly, uh, and then you Jules, can go Jules, can I stop you for a moment? Or, yeah. yeah. Jules, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that you are actually a very good respondent for us to plan uh, our next yeah. week webinar on DRC. Uh, I'm um, going to suggest, can you uh, just put your email on our group and we set it up as you DRC in the next week or two. Uh, but I think that let's let's keep this conversation going. I think there's some questions. I'd like to just shift the the focus back to Kenya, and just because there's some questions, etc. I know Grace. I, I, is it okay, Jules? We want to have a webinar on DRC, which is where we're going to talk all about what is going on in DRC. I'm sorry, I, I might have misdirected it, but can I suggest you do that? That you we, and we'll go back to questions if you can. But can we? It, Grace, can I just ask you, I know you're able to speak. Um, mm -hmm. Are you going to be talking on uh, on Kenya or would you yes. be bringing another country? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Are you going to speak on Kenya? Yes. It's a question about Kenya. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, and Jules, okay. please, we'll come back to you and please let's talk a bit about uh, the DRC, how we can uh, do one on that. Thanks, Jules. Uh, uh, my name is... Go Go ahead, Jay Grace. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Grace Mihessel. I'm a public health um, expert. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank, um, you know, the, the, the panelists. Um, I think they've really given a good account of what's happening in Kenya, both at the national and actually at the community level. So um, I had uh, two key questions. One, um, we've read about, um, you know, what's happening in, in, in uh, some of the Asian countries of the virus, uh, you know, even when you're tested negative in the second test, then, you know, a few of the people actually test back positive. Um, I'm not sure that's a reactivation or whatever it is. So what are we actually, is, is there a follow-up of people once they go home, uh, you know, to try and just ensure that if they do test uh, positive again, you know, they're able to come back, you know, so what kind of follow-up is happening? Uh, the other question is, um, uh, we've, um, you know, over the last couple of um, weeks, you know, one of the disadvantages that have come on board is uh, a real stigma stigmatization of, uh, of, of COVID illness. And as such, um, I think, you know, um, even the testing, we've had community members who are not willing to come up because that it would mean being locked away in quarantine centers that I'm glad, you know, that uh, things have improved um, over time, but initially the pictures we saw were, were, were not very pleasant to imagine getting there and of course having to pay yourself. So what are the efforts to really destigmatize um, all that? 
And then one last question for the community, um, uh, for, the, for COVID in the community, are they, are they also getting access to PPEs, you know, for the community health workers, let's say, who might be involved in helping to, um, um, you know, uh, identify those who might be affected? Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Perhaps um, Jacqueline or Joy, you can take those questions um, and uh, we can then go to the other questions that are streaming up. And uh, if we have any comments on anybody from uh, Kenya, feel free. You can add either in the chat or in the questions. Uh, go ahead, uh, Joy, Jacqueline. Yeah. Uh, I'll take the testing and the CHW and uh, Dr. Kitulu will take the stigma and Good. she'll highlight further what has been done. Uh, in terms of testing, when the patients are released from the facilities, definitely they are brought back to the community. And what we have done, we first prepare the community, the homesteads uh, to receive. Part of it is also to destigmatize, which also um, Dr. Kitulu will uh, highlight further. And then testing continues even after two weeks. Once we have had them in their homesteads after two weeks, we do reevaluate them at seven days and at 14 days at the homestead. And we encourage them even while they're at home, they should ensure that they are wearing masks and ensuring that they are cleaning up, okay. ensuring they are disinfecting their utensils so that they are not continuously shedding, also cleaning up of the latrines and ensuring that shedding is being sorted out uh, adequately. We assess the homesteads before they come home We've had two cases in the neighboring county and we've assisted them in terms of that. When it comes to CHWs, we've, uh, we, we give them uh, the surgical masks and uh, if they are in a situation where we've already trained them that where the situation is really bad, they should not engage and they should inform us uh, to come in and uh, come in with the full protective gear. Um, let Dr. Kitulu answer about stigma. I have seen other questions here which we'll also take as we move. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Feel free, Joy, to look at the questions and figure out what you'd like to answer. Okay, thanks. Um, on the issue of stigma, I think that is a, a real big issue and a real challenge which even we as the Kenya Medical Association have spoken to that um, if we are going to deal with this illness, then we need to destigmatize it. And we, it, I mean, it takes us back to the same situation where HIV was in the, in the 90s, you know, it was a highly stigmatized illness. So, um, and, and part of it is, I think has to come from all directions. And if you look at the stigma, it also comes from us healthcare workers. It comes from those in the community. It comes from how we treat certain aspects of the process. And those aspects include the testing. Um, already, I think if we're looking at our, our media, you, you have people saying they're going to put a stick down into your, into your nose, which goes all the way to your spine. You know, I, that's the, I guess that's a layman's understanding of it. Um, so that process itself is a challenge. Then the next step was, of course, going into quarantine. And, and, and initially, quarantine before our, our Minister for Health um, the last few days said that, okay, then quarantine and isolation treatment for those who are picked up from contact tracing and surveillance will be at the cost of the government. It was at the cost of the person who was picked up. So in itself, that again was another stigma. And the process of how the surveillance teams actually pick up um, those who are picked up from contact tracing, um, they come in a number, they come with a vehicle and, and you know, no questions asked, they tell you get into the van and you're moved to an unknown facility. So all those are areas, um, and then for those who are positive, uh, you of course then you'll have the teams who will come up all dressed up in the hazmat suit and gear and everything you can imagine, like a space team coming to extract someone from a facility. All those things create stigma. Um, so one of the, of, of, the, of the issues that we've raised, raised at the Ministry of Health uh, task, uh, COVID Response Task Force is how do the various teams, how do we destigmatize even from the work that we do? So that um, for the, um, the surveillance team, that whatever work we do has to have a humane approach. 
this is not a uh, I, I mean, we don't have to act like we cannot speak to people, we cannot explain to people, and that is just step number one, communicating clearly that um, th th you've been picked, you're positive, th these are your contacts, and now we are going to move to this facility. Um, the next step, of course, was also engaging in the communities. So the message was passed around that if you, um, th this is the illness, the people need to be isolated, they need to be quarantined which came, passed through very clearly, but came up with negative effects. Because one of the cases I had to deal with at the quarantine centers, were, and which really almost broke my heart, there were three children, minors, um, who, were, who were brought into the quarantine center um, because their mom who had tested positive and with a small child had been taken into hospital, into an isolation facility, and they were left at home with their dad. So they were supposed to be, they were tested at home um, and, and that's the, indeed there the, the surveillance team had picked up the, the humane part. So they said, let's test them at home. And then when we know the results, we can know where to move them. So while they were at home, the dad, of course, had to step out and buy food. I mean, the, they are in the house, they need food. When he stepped out, the neighbors went ballistic. They said he's positive and he has come out of the house. They got the police on him. He was picked up and taken away and left the children on their own at home. So again, you see all those things, there's even stigma created around the whole process. So I think it's just, again, engaging with the communities and which we can do even from the community health worker level. Uh, in terms of, yes, uh, if, if there's a family that's isolated, how do you support them? So that, yes, he had to step out because there was no food. So how do you support as the community? Um, we, we do a lot of mobile money. He could have sent one of the neighbors, bring the food, just leave it at the door or whatever it, it requires. So there's efforts which need to go at multiple levels of, 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 of management. The other level of stigma, as I said, of healthcare workers, um, there are patients coming in now who are actually going to die of non-COVID illnesses. Because if you have any fever or even a slight cough, uh, we're going to forget the malarias and all the other things that cause you know, uh, fevers. Because, and people are, um, the healthcare workers are afraid to approach the patient um, because they're saying, I don't have adequate PPE. So um, this morning we were, we were sitting uh, in a, di a discussion um, run by Kenyatta Hospital, which brings in all the hospitals that are caring for any COVID positive patients. And the pediatrician said they lost a child last two nights ago from dehydration. This is a child who, if he had a line and had fluid, would have survived. But everyone was scared to touch that child because the child was febrile. And they're saying, no, he's not been tested. We don't know his status. And so the management was sort of slowed down. So stigma appears in multiple facets. Um, so there's a part which we have to deal with. There's the part the government has to deal with it. And number one, for us, at least destigmatizing was, was from the saying, okay, if you're picked up, we're going to ensure you go to a comfortable place at the cost of the government. This is a public health measure. We pay for it. So again, that then also stops the, because many people are saying, I'm not going to get tested. Why should I bother to step in? If I'll get tested, it, it's going to be at my cost. And then I'm going to be banished by society. Um, and the other level is, of course, even for those who return from treatment, from isolation, going back into the community that we, they also have to, communities have to be engaged. Yes, they've done their treatment, they are negative. You can accept them back into community. So there, I think there are many roles for different people to address on, on that stigma issue. Thank you. Thank you, Becla. I think that's very useful a discussion. Um, I think that uh, there have been some comments related to that, and I think I just want to raise it. Perhaps Grace, uh, uh, is it Grace that has uh, Galaxy A50 has been making some comments. Uh, perhaps you can just introduce yourself and just raise some of your thoughts around it. I think you've been making comments that you don't see it as so much an issue of uh, stigma, or rather the state of quarantine facilities and affordability. Um, and you also say that before community infection started, most of those affected were better off households before quarantine facilities as below their class. Um, if perhaps, you know, you can say it loud, loud if you are. I do, I do have you, can, can do that. But anyway, Joyce, I don't know how you drive, um, drive Jackie, how would you, you respond to that? Okay, so I, I can actually see those questions on the side from Galaxy yeah. A. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so in terms of the quarantine facilities, as I said, um, when we started off, it was at a point zero deep end of the ocean, no structure. 
the, um, the cabinet, the president said, all those coming in will go into mandatory quarantine. So even before setting up the facilities, the flights started to arrive and people had to go in. Um, we've had five, six weeks of managing that. And in terms of actually ensuring that we have adequate facilities, indeed, if you're going to be into quarantine, then you need to be isolated. You can't be in quarantine in a, in a dorm sort of facility. So we've cleared those out. Um, uh, but the other bit was ensuring affordability. So the public facilities now, we there are several government facilities which can offer the services. So we have the Kenya Medical Training Colleges, the Kenya School of Government, um, there are some schools as well which have uh, isolated facilities and, um, and, and uh, ensuring that then they know what sort of level of care to give. But we do appreciate that there are those who want to be in a five-star hotel. So we have got other hotels as well that have agreed to have their staff trained and have offered their services as, as quarantine facilities. So we have a range of them. And for now, the government will cater for the public facilities. Those ones, they will pay. And if one wants to go to any private hotel, um, which is a, a designated approved uh, quarantine facility, that is also available. Um, the other question was on uh, from Galaxy A about that was, um, uh, was uh, um, that about- people were better off. I think yes. they both got quarantine facilities. Yeah, oh, yes. Uh, infection started. Most of those affected were better off households who saw the quarantine yeah. facilities as below their class. And that's what I'm saying. So in terms of, yes, we appreciate that the quarantine facility, that we are all at different levels. And But I think as a government policy, it is to ensure that it is a comfortable place. It is a place that uh, will offer the, the services that, that are needed. And indeed, it should, should not be a place where you have, uh, you know, uh, broken windows and leaky bathrooms and things like that. At least a comfortable place that can offer the, 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 uh, to, to, to separate you from the community for the time uh, when you're, before you're tested and for those who are positive uh, when they go into isolation that it's, it's comfortable. But indeed, there were challenges in the beginning and we do appreciate that. And a lot has gone to, to, to make a change around that. I think you raise a very important issue. You know, the, the broad stigma is actually quite the challenge. You know, how do people perceive it? And in some ways, the, the question of isolation and, and quarantine can actually swing that quite differently if one does it. And obviously, in Africa, we have quite a lot of resource challenges. And there's a serious risk that we take people away and put them into something that they're not very happy with. And they're actually giving up their families to be in the space for the sake of society and perhaps their family. And if it's a nice place, they'd say, well, you know, okay, that's great. And everybody would say, well, that's wonderful. I wouldn't mind being in a hotel because, you know, that might be like South Africa, that's a possibility. But if they're going to go to leaky places that they wouldn't think fit for human beings, then there's going to be a whole different uh, attitude. So it's quite a critical element. So thank you for that discussion. I think um, it's uh, at Galaxy A50s, Dr. Vincent Okungu, a health economist in, uh, in, uh, from Kigali. And you know, he's bringing up some really useful things. So I hope you'll take me up on the offer to do a webinar as well on Rwanda at another occasion. So if we can, we'll get comments. So let's go to some other questions that have been raised. And I think these have been somehow missed as we've been going along. There are two hotspots okay. in, uh, or Joy, do you have a question to raise? I, I think I'll take three questions that have Go been raised. Um, that is uh, in terms of essential um, health care, yeah. um, essential health services, mental health, and uh, private uh, practitioners, because they yes. are majority within the healthcare system of Kenya. Uh, in terms of private health care, what we did uh, in the region where I live and uh, where I also run private practice, we ensured we engaged with the county so that they offer training to most of the healthcare workers in these places. And uh, so they have been trained. We are also having routine checks of these facilities to ensure that they put the caveats as instructed, the triage area at the gate, ensuring they are screening patients before they walk into the facilities, ensuring that PPE is in place. So the uh, county government has a task of ensuring that they do those screenings 
early enough in these facilities. And that has been done. And when you come to most of the private facilities, you'll note that they have put these caveats in place. When it comes to essential health services, uh, we, um, fortunately, where I work, I am in charge of the non-communicable diseases for the county. And what we had done all the way from last year, we had started mapping out the diabetics and hypertensives within the region. Uh, our community health workers had been trained on how to engage with the diabetics at the community level. So it's been easy to reintegrate them back to their functions of ensuring their diabetics are well stocked up with medication, where they get in touch with their diabetic by phone and find that they have an illness which needs to be catered for, they refer them to the nearest health center or dispensary that's nearest home. And then the rural practitioner who's either a nurse or a clinical officer assesses them and decides, okay, uh, you need further healthcare. They refer them now to the facility where I am, which is a level four facility. And from there, we are now able to decide if we are admitting or if we are offering uh, the specialized care or referring them higher up now to the level five. So we've uh, taken down our care to the very lowest level, which is a community health worker, which has really worked out. One asked about the mental health issues. Um, we've engaged um, practitioners who have been trained in what they call the um, psychological first aid for, uh, the, for the people who are in isolation and who are in quarantine centers. And Jackie will tell you more about that, um, the way they have engaged the psychologists and mental health specialists. On our end, as Kenya Medical Association, I sit in the Committee for Physician Wellness, which we set up around three years ago, when we noted quite a number of uh, health workers were getting burnout and were committing suicide. And this Physician Wellness Committee now has reactivated and we have partnered with the Kenya Psychiatric Association and the Clinical Psychiatric Association of Kenya. And we are now offering debriefs and also um, the psychological first aid and uh, care and treatment for the health workers who do report that they do have uh, needs that would need to be engaged in terms of mental health. So something is being done. Jackie will speak more about um, the quarantine centers and isolation centers in terms of mental health. So on, on mental health, um, indeed, uh, that's a big area that we realized uh, once we went into week one of, of running the quarantine facilities. Uh, indeed, isolation is is a very antisocial thing. And uh, as humans, we, we, we don't realize how social we are until we, we, we are not allowed to, 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 to be social. So um, what we did then is to, um, from the Ministry of Health, the, uh, the Directorate of Mental Health, they took actually a big positive stand in, in, in sorting the issue. So we had a team from there uh, with, uh, headed by a psychiatrist and, and um, 10 clinical psychologists. And uh, so what we then did was to ensure that they could meet the mental um, and psychosocial health needs of those in quarantine and isolation. So they separated themselves into teams. And what happens, therefore, is that um, each is attached to a facility. And at present, also, we have now the Nairobi Metropolitan Service taking care of the quarantine facilities in Nairobi. And each of them has a psychosocial uh, um, a, a, a psychologist or a counselor on site. So then they can deal with the day-to-day -day issues that arise. But the greater bigger team then deals with also that when testing is done, because that's something that really is quite traumatizing. So that there's, uh, uh, um, once results are, are given, there's a, a team to counsel even those who are turned negative and even the ones who turn positive, especially the ones who turn positive because once they receive the results, they do have the post-test counseling, and then they have to move into isolation. So they, the psychosocial team then also take care of the ones who are in isolation, um, knowing that we've had some of our 
uh, our positive patients will remain persistently positive even up to day 32. So you can imagine a whole month going on in an, iso in an isolation facility. One of the ones who stayed on 28 days was a colleague, actually, a doctor. He was, I mean, he reached a point, he was saying, I'm going crazy. Hello. I think we lost you, Jackie. Ah, okay. I thought I was the one that was uh, crashing my computer. <laughs> it's a weekly webinar. Do you have me? Am I back? Oh, we missed you for a bit. For a while. Ah, <laughs> sorry. For a minute. Sorry. Um, so I was saying, uh, in, in so we have the psychosocial support throughout, right from the beginning, and even like for the teams who arrived from India yesterday, who are patients, we had a team of 10 counselors and, and psychologists at the airport. I mean, they said, the, I mean, the That's needs were overwhelming. Sounds great. But we made sure, because we realized the last time there was so much uh, trouble at the airport because people had questions, there was no one who, who could answer. So we had a team right there on the ground. Mm -hmm. But we are making sure that they follow through at the facilities and even continuing at home. So at least there's some support. Mm -hmm. And we, the other need, as Joy has mentioned, is the healthcare workers. We also have a major need. Everybody has their own fears. You know, I'm going back home. I've seen patients, I've, seen, I've been potentially exposed. Uh, am I a risk to my family? And the webinar we had, not this week, the other week, we had 3,000 persons uh, 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 plug into that uh, webinar. Wow. So the need is there. Everybody, I mean, the questions, the fears are there, and everybody expects you as a healthcare worker to be the tough one, to be the one, you know, I'm okay with this. But we also have fears. If you have children at home and you have family at home and you're going back to them, you're like, okay, am I the one who's going to bring problems to them? My own family, in the first few weeks when I was here, uh, I would come in and people would sort of find reasons to go to other rooms. And I was like, I asked them, <laughs> they scared of me. <laughs> oh, wow. That's true. That's true. Right. Yeah, but that's true. <laughs> No, thank you. I think there was one, uh, a joke. I think there were two other questions or two issues that I just wondered whether we covered it well enough. One was the uh, question of non-COVID services, other services being messed up through this process. And the other question that Joy has dealt with, uh, maybe raised, is the home care. How do you, how sustainable is the sort of quarantine? And is it not a possibility to look at home care sort of um, ways in which you could get the community to participate in some sort of isolation quarantine. I know that these are contentious issues, um, and I know that we are struggling in South Africa with uh, particularly these two issues. Any thoughts, uh, Jacqueline, Joy? So in terms of uh, home-based care, a guideline was released at the very start of everything, but um, having had people who are running away from uh, their homes being found in town. That's when the government enforced quarantine centers came. But for those who have been good enough to stay at home and, and, and wait for when they are test and negative, we've uh, really engaged home-based uh, quarantine and they've really done well. That guideline is there within our website for Kenya Medical Association or within the uh, national government MOH guidelines for uh, quarantine. There was another question, Prof, that you have asked uh, in um, terms it of- It was about normal uh, services. services. Yeah. Yes, there's been a challenge. As much as we are running the essential services of diabetes and hypertension, most of our cancer care patients have to come all the way to Nairobi or go all the way to Eldoret. That has been a big challenge because once they locked Nairobi, our clients can't easily access entering Nairobi. They've got to have a lot of clearances to get into the city. Uh, number two, most service providers for cancer care have closed down most of the clinics. 
uh, medication which used to come from India and outside there is also in short. I have clients who were, um, my clients in my clinic who had referred to Nairobi for cancer care, but now their care cannot continue because the medication is not available locally. So those are challenges which are being faced by some of the patients that we do have who are on essential services. But for the rest, outpatient, uh, general care, malaria, typhoid, all the other illnesses, we are caring for them. The other day I was looking at our, uh, um, our information system and looking at the illnesses we've had in the last one month. I was so pleased to see diarrhea has gone down. Unlike oh. uh, what we had previously at the beginning of the year. So positive changes uh, from hand washing have started oh. happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, normal services me, are running fine. Yeah. Let me yeah, jump in. Sorry. Maybe because uh, we, we, are, we are in different settings. Let me talk from the urban setting um, mm. in Nairobi, because I am based in Nairobi. Um, you'll be shocked that essential services have, I mean, it's, it's people have stayed away from the, from the services. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at many of the private hospitals, their attendance is down to 30%, you know, 20, 30% in some facilities mm -hmm. um, because people were scared to come in there. Uh, they're thinking, okay, yes. we've been told stay at home. So should I, should I not? And that has led to something actually that has opened up uh, an, 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 an opportunity for uh, telehealth. And that, um, so I am also a member of our regulator, the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Council. And in the last um, uh, two months, we have actually uh, given approvals to several hosp uh, hospitals and facilities to run um, uh, telehealth services because they realize that their chronic patients, you know, the patients with their diabetes, hypertension are not coming in and, and justifiably so because we've said those with comorbidities at higher risk and they're thinking, okay, I don't want to go into a facility which also has COVID patients, so am I at, at a greater risk? So how do you reach them? But the attendance has actually dropped tremendously, even in my private practice. Um, I, I'm actually opening the practice like three days a week because people were too scared to come. And even with that, I had to reach out and tell them, no, we have taken the necessary infection prevention control measures. We, this, this is how we shall pre-screen you before you come in um, so that we reduce the risk of exposure. So uh, in fact, my worry is that uh, we, we are going to have deaths because right now we've had very few deaths from COVID, but we are actually going to have deaths from non-COVID issues in That's the context right. of COVID. So um, it's, we, we they, they engage, in fact, the messaging now is to tell people, yes, you can come in, just make sure you follow the necessary engagement protocols that we also separate screening areas to make people comfortable because um, the pneumonias and things like that, and this is our season in which we have them, all those are the ones that are going to be the killers. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I think that's a debate we're having in South Africa about whether the lockdown itself and uh, you know, the COVID focus might actually be not as big a problem as the you know impact broadly. Um, the fact that non-COVID debts may become the real big problem. Um, I think that uh, we also have to look at whether services are being closed down by anxious politicians and healthcare workers in the public service as well. So in South Africa, is that happening in, in, uh, in the public service where urban services are actually saying, no, no, please do not come in, even for your basic care, like an immunization or uh, family planning, because we are having that phenomenon in South Africa. It was there for a few weeks and then it's been reduced, but still the tendency to say, please don't come to a clinic for any non-emergency. Uh, what an emergency is, is actually very debatable. So is that happening there? That's true. That's happened here in Kenya. Actually, the Director General of Health had actually set out a circular, especially to surgeons, that no non-emergency surgery should be done. Now, you see that indeed also brings in other issues. So you have, um, like for the, for the cancer patients, it, it may not necessarily be emergency, but it can turn into an emergency. 
So um, that, in it, that directive in itself then led to a response by the National Health Insurance Fund to say, okay, we will not approve um, any surgeries that are not non-emergency. So you see, the ripple effect then begins to create other problems, that things that would have been managed you know, as minor will end up being managed as major because they were not managed in time. Um, so the effort now is to go out and say, you know, you need to go in for your immunization, you know, the, the children need to go in for their immunization and all the other basic clinics should continue. But you see, once you've sent one message, it's very difficult to erase it immediately um, <laughs> because everyone is now stuck on the, on the previous one that we shouldn't, we shouldn't. The others is the dentist. So the dentists actually all close their clinics entirely. They said they would, they would only um, manage pain and uh, until further notice. But um, I think from the last two weeks, they now have set new guidelines. They've defined what is emergency. They've de defined what sort of PPE you need to have. So they are also opening up their services. So my partner is a dentist and she did open up in the last week. So yeah, yeah. so I think some things are, are beginning to change a little bit. Good, good. So thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any other comments. I know that uh, um, that we've opened the opportunity for Vincent to say something. I don't know, Vincent, if you would like to still say something about or respond or engage uh, in anything. I'm not sure that he's left us, maybe. Um, but I hope that he would have been able to, um, to actually engage with us on Rwanda because it's from Rwanda. So nonetheless, any other questions, any other comments? I think they, um, did, did you pick up anything else, Troy, that you haven't addressed to some of the attendees? Um, there were just some comments that are on there that, uh, that uh, Vincent raised about mapping resources between those with cover, I suppose private insurance and those without private insurance. Um, and I think those were comments. So I guess, I guess uh, any, any, any issues, I think you raised the issue of the public and the private. How is this sort of um, management of patients in terms of equity between private and public? Uh, what is going on generally uh, in that setting in Kenya? Perhaps we can sort of end that. I think and then one we'll... of the biggest challenge all pub, uh, private health providers have been talking about mm -hmm. is the fact that um, this testing is being done for free in uh, public facilities. Whereas now for private facilities, they have to pay for all this. And they, they are wondering what part and what role does the government have in terms of uh, provision also for them when uh, pub, uh, private practice, because they are also seeing COVID cases. And if it's a pandemic that's being sorted out by governments, then it poses a challenge for them also, since they have to ensure their staff are safe uh, they are offering care for COVID cases. So if uh, governments are also subsidizing, they feel that they also need to be subsidized for. I think that, uh, you know, there's also been the question of using private hospitals. Uh, I, I guess in Kenya, there is not that many, um, in, you know, patients yet. Is there a thought? How do you feel your capacity exists? Where is the trajectory for Kenya and the uh, the need for public-private uh, collaboration. Um, Jackie, Joey? As of the modeling that we were uh, shared, uh, we, we, we were given last, this week actually on Wednesday, our numbers are still low, but it's because we are also not testing adequately. Uh, our testing has not been large enough like what's happening in South Africa and what was happening in Ghana. But now, just as Dr. Kitulu said, we are seeing community spread. Um, and I would say it's true because uh, like right now what we are facing where I am, uh, where a young man, 13 years old, suddenly gets a COVID diagnosis. He's been in the ward for the last one month. He came in with signs and symptoms of TB. Chest X-ray was done. Uh, investigations were done. He was started on anti-TBs. But now, one month later, in the words, turns out to be COVID positive. Where else would he have gotten the infection? Very likely, probably from the facility. Uh, so that tells you 
workplace community spread. We are having the infection within us. Is it amongst the health workers? Is it amongst the visitors who are coming into the facility? We don't know. So testing needs to be done more so that we can be able to see our trajectory is this or our trajectory is the other way around. But I think so. Let me just yeah, go ahead, Jackie. Go ahead. jump in there. Um, Joy, if you remember when we had the, the, the discussion with Professor Matilu Mao, who's one of our virologists at Kemri, he said that even much as we have not reached the, the adequate number, because you're saying we need to at least reach 50,000 tests before we can have some good you know, data coming from there. But one of the things said, even with the testing we've done, our yield has been very low. We've still picked very few numbers despite that. So um, even as in, indeed as we as, as we say the numbers are that we need to do more testing, um, there's also that other side to it. Um, so, but we we cannot underscore the, the, the need for testing that it needs to be yeah. to be done, and we we are not at the the ability to do mass testing as mass testing is prescribed, but we are doing targeted testing of of hotspot areas. So there's someone who's asked about the hotspot areas um, in Mombasa, in Nairobi, in Isli. So in areas where there are hotspots where we know that there's probably more community spread, the the, or there's another the area called Kawangware, then in those areas, we are targeting the, the, the high testing in some of those areas to, to try and, and, and close off some of those. So what was a result of that then, um, the measure that was implemented then was to to, to do a lock in of those particular height spot areas, the hotspot areas. It's Lee being one and the other being the old town in Mombasa. Uh, of course, that has also come with other ramifications and people have not taken it too well. And I believe government's role, in, if you're going to pull such measures, then you really need to engage with the communities very well. You need to get the opinion leaders to be the ones who will carry that thought process and acceptance of, of what needs to be done there. So uh, of course it's uh, uh, it's bring it's brought quite a bit of hassle and I think there's been almost some near riots as well, but um, it, 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 the, the testing must go on for sure and we must do more of it to be able because you can't fight an enemy you can't see <laughs> if we don't know where it is then where do you put in a measure? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that in uh, you know for focusing on hotspots is actually quite important. You know, in South Africa there's a tendency to think of community screening going entire communities and trying to think you can go sweeping the entire country and finding, you know, the overall um, yield or presence of the virus. And it's, it's challenging to do that. So the hotspot focus is actually much more useful and particularly to look at primary health care facilities um, to look at where you can find patients mostly coming in sick and then finding them, uh, testing them especially high and then finding the, the yield showing you the hotspot. Um, so that's actually a yeah, for, 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 us, for us, probably not where there are sicker patients because we've had very few sick patients. <laughs> mean, so most mean. of our patients, yes, most uh -huh. of our patients are actually asymptomatic. And oh, the really? few that have ended up, yes, so out of the 600 and almost 30 that, cases that we have, we now have, I think, 29 deaths. And the, the deaths that have been uh, picked, those have been of, um, mostly have had some other comorbid condition. And the interesting part is that they've not come, they've literally almost like just come in today and died tomorrow, or others have died at, at, uh, when they've just popped in. So um, we, are, we, are, we are most likely not going to pick them at the hospital. <laughs> they, we, we are having just uh, spreaders out there who are asymptomatic. And even in the duration of illness, it seems to be very rapid that at the point when they consider they need to come in, it's almost too late for anything. So we've actually had very few patients even on ventilators. In all those hospital facilities, they can count how many people they've had on a ventilator. Uh, I think that's the, that was also dangerous because that means it's possibly spreading up there and we're not yeah. really getting ahead of this problem. So anyway, these are early days for you. And I think even in South Africa, we're trying to understand it, even though we've got, you know, 10 times more patients uh, than you have. So it's very, yeah. very challenging. Um, yeah. I think there's a question here and we can stop at that one is about local African remedies. Uh, is there any, uh, you know, thought about it? Um, Alatunde, if I could ask that question, any thoughts? Just, I'm not sure that you have an opinion on that. 
Um, we, we, at, at least for now, we don't have any. <laughs> we don't have any local remedies that have been uh, have been uh, brought up. The University of Nairobi is uh, starting. Uh, they, they went through all the necessary approvals, and the, um, the trials on treatment are going to include more of um, the, the standard uh, uh, treatments that are out there. Not yeah. nothing local remedy yet. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's some claims by politicians we should be all very wary of. So until there's evidence, let's be careful not to perpetuate uh, fake news um, and get involved in the politics of it. So nonetheless, thank you very much and, uh, and really appreciate uh, Jackie and Joy for presenting on this uh, insight into Kenya. I want to use the last few minutes of the webinar to just introduce Jeff and, um, I mean, and let him share a little bit of what you want to do. I think this is, this is really important that as a group of Africans that we have an organization that is a global organization supporting um, you know, a global action on primary health care. And uh, they um, are very keen to work with uh, uh, Wonka Africa and Africa PHC. So I'll leave the rest to Jeff to talk a little bit more. We really want to encourage all of you to respond um, to taking the stories from Africa, our stories, and making sure that we get a global hearing often. So Jeff, over to you. Thanks, Shabir. Uh, so my name is Jeff Markins. I'm a, a family doctor and uh, lead up the Global Health Collaborative at Boston University. And I'm also the deputy director at the Primary Healthcare Performance Initiative, PHCPI. Um, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we're a partnership between the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the WHO, the World Bank, uh, UNICEF, uh, Ariadne Labs at Harvard and Results for Development in Washington, D.C. And um, our mission is really trying to um, help uh, measure uh, primary health care in low middle income countries and, and help facilitate the move towards improvement. Uh, and we've developed a tool called the Vital Signs Profile for measuring um, primary health care. One of the things we've noticed, of course, with um, the advent of the COVID pandemic is that many primary health care providers and frontline workers and administrators and managers are really um, struggling to deal with this pandemic. Um, and there's lots of great success stories and there's lots of uh, challenging stories out there as well. And so we partnered with AfroPHC and Wonka uh, to uh, put together a blog called Primary Sources, where each week we try and push out stories from the front lines to try and elevate your voices and the experiences that you're having in trying to deal um, with this pandemic and the um, issues that um, are being brought to PHC. Uh, my colleague, uh, Maisun Chowdhury, I think is going to put in the chat section um, some links uh, for uh, this program. And I've also sent out a notice through the Afro PHC um, listserv, but we're basically looking for you all to share your stories with us. Uh, we've put together a little survey link that you can go to and just, you don't have to write a very um, detailed uh, piece. You don't have to write a whole blog piece yourself. You just need to share a couple of your experiences and ideas with us. And, um, and then if you're selected, we'll reach out to you to um, work with you to try and write a short blog, maybe 700 words or so for um, publication on the PHC website and for Afro PHC and Wonka to also disseminate through their networks. And you know, our hope is that um, through our different groups of people that we each are able to reach that we really can elevate um, the voices and importance of PHC in this time where we realize it's so critical uh, for fighting this pandemic and for maintaining essential health services. I think, you know, already I've heard great stories here today. Uh, you know, Joy talking about uh, the innovation with the booths when they were running out of PPE, um, the community outreach efforts, uh, Jacqueline's uh, discussion about the quarantine, and then also the COVID domino effect, we like to call it, where um, we're seeing uh, people suffering from the fact that they can't get essential or routine health services that really are life-saving. Um, and so we really want to help get these stories out there and make them visible. Uh, one other thing I'll just mention is uh, you'll see now in the chat that um, I soon posted the links. Uh, one of the other links we included was a, a link to an online forum that we've also started to open on resiliency and PHC. 
um, so that countries can share together around the world uh, their experiences and um, how they're trying to improve resiliency uh, in their countries. So thank you very much, Shabir. No, thank you very much, Jeff. And I just want to emphasize, please don't stress about, you know, I have to write anything major. It's, it's even if it is bad English, don't worry about it. Just put whatever you have, sort of whatever you think, you know, it's interesting, put it out there. That's not going to be published. It's just for us to look at. Once we see it, we see that, you know, really there's some interesting stuff that we would like to then sit with you and, and work on it to help you rewrite it. And I help you, we will help you write it. And uh, if you can get some pictures, if you've got some video, uh, you know, we'll talk it through. So don't worry about it, the detail. This is not about trying to put you on the spot in any way. Uh, we just want your story. So Jackie and Joy, you'll have lots of things that you can contribute. So I think there's a multitude of blogs that we can put out there. Please, I hope you will work with us in trying to make sure that your little experiences, you know, to be chunked up and, and constitute some nice blogs. I think for all the other people that we're hoping to get together on, uh, you know, on, on a webinar each week, we really want you to see it and we want you to be real. You know, your experience in the first person. It's not a, a scientific piece. It's me sitting there and saying, like Joy has shared, what exactly have your challenges been as on the front line healthcare worker? So it's, it's exactly that. Jackie, if you want to respond and I think enjoy, if you want to make some closing remarks um, and then we can close. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to, to, to share on this and share in some of the experiences. I, I think what I've found over the last few weeks, um, engaging in various uh, forums where we can discuss uh, you know, management from different views has been very helpful in, in sort of also uh, propelling us in, in what direction we move. So I think this is a, a very useful uh, a sort of engagement. And um, I, I think, as I told you, uh, Dr. Sherwood, before we started, uh, this, we started, even this shall come to pass. So uh, we shall go through the struggle with the highs and lows. It will come to pass. I'm a perpetual optimist, and I, I want to look and at it that way. Otherwise, then we'll give up. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Absolutely. And I think we must look, as Jeff has said, you know, use the opportunity to lift primary health care out and make Absolutely. it something that is seen as really providing a huge benefit to our response. Often in this epidemic, everybody's getting so focused on the hospital. And here we've been talking about all these issues on the ground that are already there. You know, we haven't had many deaths. The drama will come with the deaths, but the real drama is what we sit with every day, uh, you know, with the exact things you just talked about, about patients and responding to you as a GP and um, the community. And there's so many, there's so much things happening so I think we really need to let that come up and say that we are the real heroes in the COVID response, primary of care. So we really want everyone to get that going. Joy, any comments and then we can close. Mine is to say, um, this is the time for family physicians to show what we do in terms of bending the curve from the primary health care level. Uh, it's not our time to give hydroxychloroquine. It's not our time to give uh, medication, but we can prove from the very primary healthcare level that we can bend the curve. Sorry, Jacqueline, uh, Joy has gotten very cut off. By but, educating uh, communities, by engaging community leaders, by uh, by engaging community leaders and ensuring that we tackle this uh, COVID situation at the very community level. So get out there, do something in the community. Do not wait for the infections to come so that you do something. Thank you, Joy. And Joy, I, I really I hope that May soon is going to follow up with you because I think you know there's a rich story you've got to tell. And I think there are a couple of blogs in there I can see. Um, in addition to that, I just want to share that in Johannesburg, we have had um, you know, work being done on how to get primary health care facilities ready for response. And there's some really important issues in terms of infection control. So I would strongly advise um, everyone to just have a quick look at the website, my website, profmusa.com. I look at the COVID Johannesburg and some important documents there. Um, we're busy. We've submitted the document through to national government as well as to the WHO, and we hope that there'd be some response. I know that uh, 
we will have we had at some point somebody from the WHO. I'm not sure that somehow we've lost. Aisha was there as well at the beginning, but we'd really like to get some WHO thoughts on uh, on how we respond at the prime health care level and strengthen what we're doing. So with that, I think thank you all very much. It's been a great uh, meeting uh, webinar, and I hope that we can. Oh, Aisha, will you be able to just to, to mention a few things or just in fact uh, make a comment? So thank you, Aisha, for coming on. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. Uh, do you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, thank you, we do. I'm, uh, again, I'm really pleased by the presentations and thank you to uh, the panelists. It was excellent. Um, I, had, I really did appreciate and I'm following what's going on. I'm based in headquarters, but really following closely what's going on in Africa. And uh, to see how the Kenya, uh, how Kenya reacted and how did it put in place every step to uh, control uh, correctly the disease is uh, amazing. And um, I would like to next week or the week after as we, we, we have this webinar quite often to see also the evolution. And my main, main issue or question was uh, uh, regarding the people that were seeking care outside uh, Kenya and came back this week. Um, I wanted to know if it was possible for you to trace them, track them correctly, knowing that they, all of them, most of them were having underlying conditions and uh, how you were going to manage uh, those people with already some issues and maybe if they develop the disease, how you, you were going to, did you think about the, the human resources you would need and the space you will need for them. Thank you. No, thank you. I think Jacqueline has gone through that quite extensively. Jacqueline, any yeah. comments? So for those who have come in, um, th those who have just recently come in and, um, and, uh, and a special exemption was given to them for quarantine at home, um, were those who had com comorbid conditions. And uh, for like the, those who came from India, most of them were really cancer patients or transplant patients. Now, um, part of what we have done is to have the public health teams be the ones to follow them up. And that's why we've got their exact locations, uh, their resi residential address, their telephone number, and their local doctor. So we, our process of referral, even for treatment abroad, requires you to have a sign-off letter from the Ministry of Health and from the um, Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Council. So you can't, I mean, yes, you have a choice to go and have treatment anywhere, but you just need to have a letter of sign-off. So what that does, then it makes sure that there is that continuous link so we are holding your doctor accountable for you. We are holding the public health teams so we now know that you are part of the, of the people they have to follow up. And all those who come in, and then there was a prerequisite that all of them had to have been tested. So they all had to come in. There were no positive COVID uh, patients coming in. So okay. they shall be retested again uh, at day, four, day 13, so that uh, as of 14, then they, they, they can be released from the, the quarantine at home. So yes, there, there, is, there is the need for more manpower, but because already we had quarantine facilities set up and there were already teams covering different areas, then the manpower already exists. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, Aisha, and, uh, Aisha, please send message through to our colleagues. Um, we really want uh, some more, some, um, you know, any others, and please uh, liaise with me if you think that we can have a little bit of a topic discussion as well as we proceed. So please um, ensure that we have our colleagues from WHO using this opportunity to understand what's going on. So really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. I will do so. Thank you. Good, good. So any other comments? I think we're kind of wrapping up a bit. So there's lots of thanks. We really appreciate all of you. Uh, thank you to Joy and Jackie for sharing the, the insights from uh, Kenya. Uh, I think really people have appreciated it uh, considerably. Uh, and Jeff, thank you once again, and Maisun for coming on and being part of it. Uh, and we'll try to keep it, I hope you'll keep a tab on it regularly, weekly, and we'll just try and ensure that, uh, that everybody is, uh, is, is getting, uh, you know, getting to share their stories. Uh, I want to just remind everyone uh, that the video, uh, the, the, the video uh, uh, recording 
is available. So if you go to prophmusa.com and look for today's webinar, you'll see the video in about two to three days, the recording available. So if any colleagues want to look at it, please share it with them. So with that, I want to thank you all once again. Please keep safe. Enjoy your weekend. One more thing is that there is a webinar on Sunday, which is a Wonka webinar. If you want to go to globalfamilydoctor.com and you'll see the webinar that is on Sunday, a very useful one talking about PHC and UHC. Um, a pity that I didn't do it, but you'll see it on the website, prophmusa.com as well. Just go there and you'll see the link to the webinar. Please do join us on Sunday as well. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.